Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Justin Peters. I hope that you and your family are doing well today. I want to thank you very much for watching this video. If you have not watched the previous video that I did entitled My Thoughts on the Election, I would encourage you to please do so. Because if you haven't watched that video, then this video won't make a whole lot of sense. So please watch the other one if you haven't already done so. Uh, because this video is a bit of a clarification video and an explanatory video because after watching my video, uh, my wife and I both uh, discuss it that some people may have misunderstood a, one of the points that I was making. And basically that video is uh, I put up to make the case that we should vote for Donald Trump. I believe everyone should, but uh, especially believers. My plea was to those people who call themselves evangelical and yet say that they just can't vote for Trump. And uh, they would say, and I gave two prominent examples, Karen Swallow Pryor and John Piper, who in recent weeks have written articles to this effect. And basically the premise of their, their argument is this. We can't vote for Joe Biden because he is pro-choice, pro-abortion, and we can't support him because that is supporting the murder of babies. Kudos. That's exactly what abortion is. And the Democratic Party is the party of infanticide. They support the unrestricted access to dismembering and murdering babies in the mother's womb at every stage in pregnancy. The, the De Democratic Party's God is abortion, is killing babies. That is their God. And I say that with no exaggeration, with no hyperbole, without any prick of conscience. The Democratic Party is the party of murdering babies. I do not apologize for that. And so they, they rightly say, they and other evangelicals, thankfully a minority, but nonetheless a significant minority, say, uh, so we clearly can't vote for Joe Biden, but we can't vote for Donald Trump either because Donald Trump represents a whole other uh, swath of sins. Donald Trump is crass. He's vulgar. He, he uses profanity. He's arrogant. Uh, he, he's, he's prideful. And so these sins uh, will condemn people to hell as well. And so we can't vote for him either. And so we're going to write in a third party candidate. And I say that that is a wasted vote. I, I just disagree with that logic. Um, so let me show you this video clip. It's a short clip from my previous video, my thoughts on the election. And I, I want to offer a bit of clarification to make you make sure that you understand what I was and was not saying. I don't want people to think that um, exactly what I said in this clip is how I view uh, Donald Trump, because I, if you got that impression, then that would not be fair to him, nor fair uh, to my own belief. So anyway, let me show you this, and then I'll explain. Let me give you another hypothetical just to illustrate the point. And granted, this stretches credulity, of course, but it's just for purposes of illustration. Let's say you find yourself in the 1930s Germany, and an election is coming up, and you have an opportunity to vote for either A, Adolf Hitler, who is promising to exterminate the Jews, or B, someone named, let's call him George, and you clearly cannot vote for Adolf Hitler because he's promising to exterminate the Jews, and uh, but you don't really like George either. He's promising to protect the Jews, but George is just uh, just a nasty guy. I mean, he's got a He's got a potty mouth, and, and he's been unfaithful to his wife, and he's clearly not a Christian, but he does promise to protect the lives of the Jews, and you have every reason to believe that he will follow through on his word by the people that he appoints and whatnot, but you just can't vote for George either because he's just such a, just such a not a nice guy, even though he's going to protect the Jews and Adolf Hitler's openly saying he's going he's gonna to kill him. What do you do? Do you write in someone? What, what do you write in Babe Ruth? Because you clearly can't vote for Adolf Hitler, but you don't like George either. You, you vote in Babe Ruth. You see it's a wasted vote. What would you do? Well, I would hope you would vote for George. 
And so our concern was that people may have seen that and have assumed that those are reflective of my views personally of Donald Trump as an individual, that I think that he is this mean, nasty, vile, you know, wretched, racist kind of a person. And and I I see nothing redeemable about the man other than he is pro-life. But other than that, I just think he's absolutely an awful human being. And dear friends, that that is not true. Uh, I actually do like Donald Trump. I think he truly loves this country. I think he truly wants to do what is best for this country. Um, And people say, well, he's just not a nice guy. Well, let me frame it this way as far as whether or not he's a nice guy. I I think he does do a lot of nice things, but uh, I I am not going to cede the argument that people make that uh, Joe Biden is nice and Donald Trump is not when Joe Biden supports the unrestricted slaughter of innocent little children in their mother's wombs. If that is your definition of nice, then uh, let me tell you something. You and I have a very different definition of what nice is. So I'm not going to cede the nice argument to Joe Biden over Donald Trump, who wants to protect the lives of these little children. Is he a regenerate man? No, no, he's not. And we're going to explore Uh, I'll show you some of the reasons why I don't think he is regenerate at all. And I I think it is a disservice to the gospel when some evangelical leaders such as Robert Jeffress and others say that he is a regenerate man. He is a genuine Christian. I don't believe he is, and we'll see that from his his own mouth. So I don't believe he's regenerate. Um, But neither do I believe he is the worst human being walking on the planet either. I, I don't believe that some of, um, some of the accusations that have been made against him are fair. Uh, specifically, people say he's a racist. I don't think he's a racist, and, I, and I'm going to show you why I don't. So uh, there is a softer side to Donald Trump, and um, you know, I've, I've seen quite a bit from him that makes me think he's, uh, he's a nice guy. Sinner? Yes. Unregenerate? Unfortunately, at this point, yes. Unregenerate. Uh, But, you know, there's a lot of nice lost people out there. And Donald Trump uh, does have a softer side. And so I want to be fair to him. And uh, I want to push back against uh, this this notion out there, even coming from many evangelicals, specifically, as I mentioned in my video, my thoughts on the election, uh, Karen Swallow Pryor and Donald, uh, excuse me, John Piper, saying that basically he's just this horrible wretch of a man. Uh, So anyway, just a little bit of the softer side of Donald Trump. We're going to look at that. Uh, Also, hang on in this video. We're going to explore whether or not Donald Trump is a racist. And uh, we'll end the video by giving you, um, uh, by giving the gospel. And I hope by some providence of God that maybe even Donald Trump himself will end up watching this video. And I hope that he does. Probably won't happen before the election. He's pretty busy right now. But um Maybe even years later. Who knows? I hope so. So um, watch this a little bit of the of the softer side, the more compassionate side of Donald Trump that the media doesn't want you to see. He's the adorable kid who stole hearts everywhere when he went in for a hug from President Trump. We caught up with eight-year-old Jordan McLinn and his mom, Laura. So Jordan did go in for the hug, you know, just to say thank you. And the president... Um, didn't really realize it, so it took like three times, but Jordan didn't give up on that hug. It was the sweetest thing. It was kind of like, you know, a grandpa just reaching down and just giving the most natural, the sweetest hug ever. Jordan has a terminal form of muscular dystrophy. His life expectancy is just 25 years. He was in the nation's capital for the signing of the Right to Try law, which gives terminally ill patients easier access to experimental drugs. Jordan says the president was envious of one thing. Jordan, what did the president say to you? He said he wanted my hair. If I had that head of hair, I would have been president so long ago. What a little charmer. So there you see a a softer side to Donald Trump that you don't often see. Uh, And there's a lot of clips of Donald Trump doing this, as I found in doing some of the research for this video, of of just being very kind to children and taking time out of his day to to just be nice to them, talk to them, pat them on the back, uh, kind of grandfatherly 
way towards them. And uh, Donald Trump was signing the Right to Try Act. And this is another one of the reasons that I like Donald Trump, because this act gives terminally ill patients the freedom, the opportunity to try, Right to Try Act, to try some experimental medications that have not yet passed through all of the rigmarole and red tape of the FDA, uh, go through this long, years and years long, laborious process laden with red tape before it can finally be approved. In the meantime, uh, while all of this testing and regulations are uh, going through, you have to go through all these hoops, uh, maybe the medicine actually is effective and can help them, uh, at least in improve their quality of life for a while uh, but yet they they can't they can't access it because it's mired in all this red tape and this is one of the examples of Donald Trump cutting through some of the red tape and basically saying that this is what the act does for people who are terminally ill who might benefit from some of these medications that haven't yet been approved and Donald Trump is saying you know what you have a terminal illness and you may not have that much time to wait for this long laborious process to go through all of its channels and so i'm just gonna hey since you're terminally ill if you want to try this medication you can try it and that's one of the things that he's done is cutting through a lot of this these regulations and red tape and uh so um you know kudos to, you would never see a democratic president do this because the democratic party is all about regulation and red tape so anyway and notice in the background these are uh, in the in the scene there in that video you see some uh, two other gentlemen who are in uh, wheelchairs and one of the arguments one of the false accusations that is that have been uh, raised against Donald Trump is that he has mocked disabled people uh, specifically a reporter from the New York Times who is disabled and Donald Trump mocked him uh, watch this written by a nice reporter now the poor guy you got to see this guy oh i don't know what i said ah oh, i don't remember he's going like i don't remember I, oh maybe that's what i said this is 14 years ago he still they didn't do a retraction that reporter he is talking about is serge kovaleski who now works for the new york times as you can see right there he suffers from a chronic condition that impairs movement of his arms a Times spokesman says they find it outrageous that Trump would ridicule the man's appearance. Mm. That looks bad, doesn't it? Yeah, it, it, it does. It seems like Donald Trump really was mocking him. Until you see clips like this. And we'll get some of these regulators out of the banks so you can borrow and you can help. Because, you know, the banks, the banks now, they can't do anything. They're, they're run by the regulators. In all fairness to the banks, they're run by the regulators. When you see the president of the bank, I mentioned the word regulator. Oh, these guys come in, they run the banks. And I watched a general recently on television. And they said to him, what do you think about ISIS? Oh, ISIS is very tough. And I'm saying, first of all, why is a general on television? I don't want my generals on television. Well, I heard Ted's a good debater. I said, he is a good debater, but he can't talk, okay? Bad talker. He's a good debater, bad talker. So he's over here. They asked him about waterboarding. They said, Senator Cruz, what do you think of waterboarding? Oh, I don't want to talk about it. You know, he didn't, he didn't want to talk about waterboarding because too controversial. And I'm saying to myself, they're chopping off heads. He doesn't want to talk about waterboarding. So you see, this is just something Trump does from time to time. It's just one of his little personality quirks. It's just something he does. In fact, I was watching another clip of Trump uh, not related to the disabled stuff at all. He's just being an interview. And much to my surprise, uh, I mean, I was watching this clip for a totally unrelated reason, but he did it again. W watch this. One of the, we don't know. I don't know for a fact that it's Ted I'll Cruz. I'll tell you what, if you look at his answer, because somebody asked him, do you think it's you? And he went, uh, uh, well, uh, 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 he, uh, uh, believe me. After I saw that, I said, it's him. He shouldn't be doing that. Very so in this interview, Trump was being asked about Ted Cruz. This was from back in 2016. I uh, was still in the primary season there in the 2016 uh, presidential race. And that was Trump's response to a question about Ted Cruz. He did that weird little, you know, quirky thing again and uh, has nothing to do with anybody being disabled. Ted Cruz is very much able-bodied. So this is just another example of how the media take something that Trump does and they blow it all out of proportion 
and accuse Trump of things that he just does not do and, and is not. And I, so I, I'm not worried at all about Trump. Trump doesn't mock disabled people. And, and I can say that as a disabled person born with cerebral palsy. In fact, you can see my crutches right there in the, uh, there we go, <laughs> right there in, in the screen. So um, doesn't bother me. So maybe Trump doesn't mock disabled people like they say, but but he is a racist. I mean, it's it's obvious that Trump is a racist. That's what the media tells us all the time. He refuses to condemn white supremacy. He refuses to condemn the KKK, and uh, he's a racist. Kyle James Howard, you know, he tells us that all the time. Uh, Trump is he's a racist, no doubt about that one, right? No doubt. There is no such thing as a very fine neo-Nazi. I would agree with you. Yeah, I would agree. Let me ask you this. Would it change your opinion if Trump agrees with you and he had said that at that exact same conference? Oh, it would have helped. You know, with this election coming up, there have been a lot of accusations of racism, and it struck me that a lot of people still believe President Donald Trump did not condemn white supremacy in Charlottesville, North Carolina. Where peaceful protesters were protesting racial injustice. And then on the other side, there were neo-Nazis. The commander in chief said there were fine people on both sides. His ass buddy says there's a moral equivalence. There are good people on both sides. No one wants to hear from the man who says there are very fine people on both sides. Essentially suggesting that there are very fine people in the Nazis. Something no president's ever, ever said. He said they're very fine people on both sides. I realized there was no video actually questioning people about this. It didn't exist, so I decided to make one myself. But I had to go in in disguise. Let me ask you, do you think that Donald Trump has, has he done enough to condemn white supremacy? No. You don't think so? No. <laughs> no. So personally, I, I don't think so. Do you think that uh, Donald Trump has done enough to condemn white supremacy? I mean, it's kind of a trick question if you ask me. Oh, okay, sorry, well. Just the point that he's always, at least not speaking up uh, mm -hmm. very clearly uh, in condemning some groups. Right. I think it's pretty clear when you look at comments like, can you condemn David Duke? And there's a hesitation and two week, or a week or two later he responds with, Yes, I condemn it. So you think he hasn't been he hasn't been as clear as he needs to be? In my opinion, no. Do you think that Donald Trump is a racist? Oh, absolutely. Okay, and what makes you uh, say that? I listen to every word he says. Every word? Every word. Because of a lot of the things that he said um, just throughout all of his speeches, especially in context to the coronavirus, calling it the China virus and things such as that, like, it's, yeah. Just, you know, I just don't think that he really like Mexicans, he hates Mexicans. There hasn't been a unilateral, like on every single front, that white supremacy is bad from Donald Trump. There's been hesitations, there's been missteps very consistently, and I think that's right. what's opening the door for a very, uh, unfortunately, racist base. So um, like, like yeah. Charlottesville, like an example, find people on both sides? Yeah, I mean, things. I think that was, to me, what's kind of a unnecessary comment. And I think just knowing how if you're so against the media, then why give them something to look for? Right. You why know? not just say clearly, yeah, what, yeah. white and supremacists, yeah. they should be condemned totally. Yeah, exactly. Right. And I think once that's said, then then I think that's just, to me, it's an easy thing to do. Right. What bothered you most about uh, his comments on Charlottesville? Oh, the, the good people on both sides. Okay. It should be pretty easy <laughs> to condemn white supremacy, neo-Nazis, outright in no uncertain yeah. terms. David Duke should be a very easy person to right. disagree with. Right. Or condemning yeah. white supremacists or neo-Nazis in Charlottesville. Yeah. Right. You would have and you would have liked to see both of those. Yes. To make sure we're talking about the same thing. This was this was Charlottesville. Yes. Right? You have the first yep. uh, this is the yeah, play it. This is the one that we are talking about, they right? Showed, they showed him Charlottesville. Good people on both sides. And you had some very bad people in that group. But you also had people that were very fine people on both sides. Right, that yeah. we're talking about. And yeah, I wish he would have. That is one of the moments. There is no such thing as a very fine neo-Nazi. I would agree with you. Yeah, I would agree. Let me ask you this. Would it change your opinion if Trump agrees with you and he had said that at that exact same conference? Oh, it would have helped. Would your opinion of him be different if he had done those things? And then it would be better. Condemning. Uh, no, not really. It wouldn't change my mind. Really? Yeah, it okay. would. Okay. 
Why well, not? he's saying it now because he knows he's in trouble. <laughs> well, no, he's been saying it for a very long time. Have you seen um, the full clip? You're changing culture, and you had people, and I'm not talking about the neo-Nazis and the white nationalists, because they should be condemned totally. But you had many people in that group other than neo-Nazis and white nationalists, okay? Does that change your opinion on maybe, did, have you seen that before today? Uh, I think I have, I don't remember the last part. Right, where you condemned white supremacy. Yeah. Did you know about that full context before you saw that clip? I haven't seen the full clip. Does that help, like you said? You know, it helps, but uh, there, it, it goes on and on and on. Like, I don't think that has a big influence on my opinion one because like I said, like those two comments aren't the only parts. It's been a very consistent part of his rhetoric. But do you, you know? think with Charlottesville, do you think that was dishonest of the media to say he didn't condemn white supremacy when he did? At that certain instance? Yes. Um, no, I don't think it was dishonest. I think they were just pulling from an actual thing that he said out of his mouth. But what you're reading and you what know, you watch, you never actually heard or saw the comments of Donald Trump condemning white supremacy at Charlottesville. Is that, no, I did correct? see it. Yeah, I did see that. Did you know about that full context before you saw that clip? I haven't seen the full clip. I, I, I'd seen the clips, and oh, that's okay. why I told you whenever you first in, um, interviewed me, or the start of this interview, mm -hmm. is my thoughts on that, and I think that he can do more. I think the media is biased in that way. Like, obviously, that's not what's going to get used on CNN. Does it worry you that that's the first time you're seeing that, considering... No, it, I've seen that before. Oh, but you, you said that he didn't. Would it change your opinion if Trump agrees with you, and he had said that at that exact same conference? Oh, it would have helped. I, I listened to the strength of what he says. But you didn't know until just now that he said, I'm not talking about white supremacists or neo-Nazis mm -hmm. who should be condemned totally. And you just said that had he condemned it in no uncertain terms, you would have viewed him differently. Do you well, view it I don't think I don't think I view him differently like from that. He hasn't done enough yeah. in general. In general, yeah. Right. I mean, I think just... There's been other instances that you can really, I know you're talking specifically about that clip. Right, but I, let me go, doesn't change your opinion though. No, and I mean, he says there are fine people on both sides. What about David Duke? Sure. Uh, David Duke and robocalls are out again, the white supremacist movement supporting you. Uh, do you have any know. words for that? Well, I disavow. David Duke endorsed me? Okay. All right. I disavow, okay? When we looked at it and looked at the question, I disavowed David Duke. So are you prepared right now to make a clear and unequivocal statement renouncing the support of all white supremacists? Of course I am. Of course I am. When Chris... Tell me when you want me to stop. This goes on for about nine minutes. <laughs> the exact same question. I said, I disavow. I disavowed then. I disavowed today on ABC with George Stephanopoulos. I disavowed again. I have eight minutes, so it might grow redundant, but you can tell me when you think it's enough. I mean, I think, yeah, I think that's enough, so... Over the years... I totally I totally disavow the Ku Klux Klan. I totally disavow David Duke. Ultimately, he got to the Ku Klux Klan, which obviously I'm going to disavow. I've rejected David Duke, rejected David Duke. Uh, I've rejected the uh, KKK. I, I think I get the okay. point of the video. So we went through Charlottesville, and you said in general, um, I mean, it could be a, a two-hour video. Does that change your opinion, again, at all, on his position in outright condemning in no uncertain terms white supremacy? Um, no, I mean, I'm not saying that Donald Trump is the president of, like, white supremacy. I think he just could have done more. Well, again, it's the inconsistency that's been, like, the open door for uh, white supremacists and white nationalists and neo-Nazis to support him. Does that change maybe your opinion on Donald Trump's view there? No? No, it doesn't. So you don't care so much about what he said? No. 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 What, what would be required for you to say that he's adequately condemned them? It, it, it's it's a good point you make, and it's 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 a it's a matter of degree of strength, but it's a good point you make. I think you watched that clip for the first time, and you could have said, you know what, I still don't like Donald Trump, but that changes the context. I think that would have been a better no, answer, but, just, but instead just, you argued that he still hadn't done enough, know, and so I disagree with you. I, I know, think he's done enough I think to were, condemn white supremacy. I know, I know I'm embarrassed that I got into this. And... Hmm. So maybe he did condemn white supremacy and... The David Duke and the KKK. I, yeah, gosh, I, I guess he did. Hmm. But deep down, you know, he, he's he's still a racist deep down. He is, right? Well, for us, I guess. Um, quick final question. Trump, when you have him on the show, the minute the camera goes off, is it a different guy or is it the same guy? Same guy. Exact same. Oh, yeah. How did I do? Was I good? I know I was good. You know, tell me, tell me I was good. His wife's great, too. Yeah. She's, a, she's a great lady, has great kids. There's a lot to be said for Donald Trump. 
He's a, yeah, there's a lot, you know, he's a good guy. He is really a good guy. He's not a racist. I, yeah. He's not a racist. I, yeah. So there's Larry King, who knows Trump really well, has known him for many, many years. And he says he's the same guy off the camera as on the camera. And he says he's a good guy and he's not a racist. Now, Larry King is no bastion of conservative thought. And yet he says that uh, Donald Trump is not a racist. Not only does Larry King say he's not a racist, but uh, there's another uh, King, if you will, who says that he is not a racist. Watch this. Well, more media backlash over President Trump's comments about certain countries during his recent meeting on immigration. This, even as the president honors Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day. But isn't he just acknowledging the serious problems in those countries and the need for a strong America to address these issues? Joining us now with her reaction, the niece of Dar Dr. Martin Luther King and Fox News contributor of Elva King. Nice to see you, ma'am. As always, good morning. Thank you. Uh, your uncle fought real racism uh, at home, uh, certainly, and throughout uh, much of this country and made real change. What is it when everything is racist, when that is the, the word now that everybody paints everything with that they don't like, does nothing become racist, racist? Does it in some way sort of cheapen what your uncle fought so much to defend against and to stop? Well, I believe Rachel just put it best. And by the way, good morning, good everyone. Good morning. Fox and friends, thank you for being on it with real news and not fake news. <laughs> so to that. answer we your try. question, absolutely. Racism is just a word that's being bandied and thrown about and thrown at the president, in my opinion, unjustly. President Trump is not a racist. I've been with the president recently uh, quite a bit, and when he signed the legislation making the historic site, Martin Luther King site in Atlanta, Georgia, a national park, it was introduced by uh, Congressman John Lewis, and that, is, believe it or not, that's one thing the two of them did together. It took two to do it, and I'm so glad the president has done it. But what is so outrageous to call a man a racist who continues to acknowledge the significant work of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., my uncle, in a positive way. Mm -hmm. And he puts his money where his mouth is. He puts his energy behind it. And in making America great again, you know, perhaps saying that in Haiti and in Africa, the, you know, Africa is a huge continent with many nations. There was no offense to the people, a lot of dignity to the people. But the hell holes in that, some of their own leaders in Africa and Haiti have have taken advantage of them and the area and done a disservice to the people. So and, and, and again, Rachel, yes, to have a strong America, a compassionate America who can really help nations like Haiti and all the African nations. African people are brilliant. Haitian people are brilliant, productive and wonderful, and they deserve better. And I believe that President Trump not only understands that, but is making America great again so we can be a big help to clean up some of the hell holes across the world and in our own nation. He's doing a great job with prison reform and helping those mm -hmm. prisoners come back to society to lead productive lives. Mm -hmm. He said to people mm -hmm. on Medicaid, okay, you need assistance, that's a good thing, but you need to work as well. Have the dignity of a job. I Absolutely. like all of those things. The little babies in the womb. I could go mm -hmm. on and on I about all the good things he's doing. <laughs> so, so could he. Sometimes you got to ask one question and get one great answer, and that's where we have to leave it. Alveda King, thank you very much for what you do and for your insight this morning. We appreciate it. So there you have it, dear ones, uh, straight from the mouth of Martin Luther King Jr.'s niece, Alveda King. And so, uh, again, this is someone who knows Trump very well, has been around him a lot. And, uh, you know, if anybody was going to accuse Trump of being a racist, I suppose she would be in a position to do that. And she doesn't. In fact, quite the opposite. Uh, she says very clearly he's He's not a racist. So you just heard from people who know him well, spent many years with him, know him very well, and they're very clear. No, Donald Trump is not a racist. So um, Kyle James Howard and all the other social justice warriors, you know, they would like you to think that. The liberal media would like you to think that. Um, but the fact of the matter, he's not. Uh, from the people who know him best, he's, he's not. And his record, I think, speaks to that, does it not? I mean, up until the pandemic hit 
black unemployment rate is the lowest that it's ever been in in recorded history in the United States of America. So, uh, I mean, that speaks volume. Donald Trump has done a lot for the black community, an awful lot, far more than Barack Obama did, far more. And so it's just amazing to me that these that people would disparage him in that way and call him a racist when he when he clearly is not. And Donald Trump apparently has quite the long history of doing some very kind and generous acts for complete strangers. Watch this. And I just want to know if the story is true or not. You were traveling to Atlantic City and your limo broke down. Husband and wife pulled up behind and the husband basically said, I'm going to help him out. So he helped out the limo, limousine and a week later, the husband and wife received the deed to their house paid off. Was that a true story? It's well, true. It's true. The check? He gave you a $10,000 check? Yeah, yeah. He ended up, um, well, after I met him, uh, it was just, uh, so I started walking in the white tent, and uh, they all just all started clapping, and I, I felt God's presence in there. I really did. And, uh, you know, and Donald Trump is the most genuine, humble, caring person I've ever met in my life. And I owe everything to him. You know, he did a lot for my dad who's battling cancer. And uh, I don't what ever know how to repay him. But, uh, what did he do for your dad? Uh, he he uh, turned around and uh, said, take care of him. And, mm -hmm. um, and then he, he, he leaned over and said, write him a check for $10,000. And uh, Today, President Trump, flanked by former champ Lennox Lewis and boxing superfan actor Sylvester Stallone, issued a pardon. The president hinted at this potential forgiveness weeks ago, tweeting, Sylvester Stallone called me with the story of Jack Johnson. His trials and tribulations were great. And here's the commander in chief at Joint Base Andrews in Maryland as he prepares to board the helicopter. He notices the Marines. It's not, it's, it looks like a hat. It's not a hat. It's referred to as a cover, but it blew off. Oh, the president oh, picks it up to place it back on the Marine's head, but it blows off again. And then another military official then grabbing the cover. <laughs> And that's a valiant effort by the president. That's Good your try. daily click today. And look how poised the Marine yeah. is during Didn't the yeah, move. Absolutely. That was. Never moved. And sometimes I think that he does it because he, he realizes that he, he can. He just walks into a politically fraught situation. This has, you know, the politics of abortion, life, health care, everything. And he just walks in and says, you know what, I want to help that kid. He much very famous and had lots of money would be interested in saving a poor Georgia farmer to help save his family farm that's been in his family for hundreds of years. What it meant to us going to New York um, to meet Donald Trump was a celebration. It was we met at breakfast to go over um, raising enough money to save most of the farm. And so we were there for like a burning of the deed ceremony. Don't often see that side of President Trump portrayed, do you? And nor do you often see things like this. And Donald Trump put in a phone call to a widow, widow of an American soldier who was killed in battle, and Donald Trump put in a personal phone call to her. Here, listen to this. Yes, sir. Hello, sir. I want to thank you, um, President Trump. Those words are very kind. He was an amazing man, an amazing husband, and an amazing soldier. And uh, I, I couldn't be more proud of my husband than I am right now, sir, to be honest with you. Um, it's what my husband wanted to do. Yeah. Yes, he's just an all-around guy, and um, I, I'm glad that you got to get to know a little bit about him and get to hear a little bit about him, sir. Um, my husband is, uh, to me, he was already my hero, to be honest with you. We've been together 15 years, five children, um, run down real quick, 2017, 15, 12, and four. My son is currently um, in college in Missouri playing football, so when I say all-around a hero, yes, and but now it's like the world gets to know he is an American hero, so thank you. I really, really appreciate it. I really do, sir. Thank you. That is so, that's so amazing. It's so amazing. And I'll tell you, when you're around, if you could, you know the people to deal with, but 
If you're around uh, Washington, you come over and see me at the Oval Office, okay? Yes, sir. You just come over and see me because you are just the kind of family. This is what we want. And how, so how good a football player is your son at Missouri? That's a good... He's got to be pretty good. That's a good team, right? Yeah, yes, sir. He's cornerback. He's been playing since he was five. And he got a, a full academic um, scholarship when we were stationed in Hawaii. Um, Schofield Barracks, sir. So it's his life. That's what he always wants to do. He, he, you know, he's doing it, sir. He's making me proud and he's making his father proud in heaven. So I have no complaints. I really don't. I'm, I'm a proud so woman. He got an academic, he got an academic scholarship, not oh, a yeah, sports scholarship. Not a sports scholarship. It, it was academic. He's had a 3.7 and above, sir, since the grades could from kindergarten all the way up to 12th oh. grade. Me and my husband, we never had to worry and never had to stress on him doing it. And just to add that he loves football on it first, there are no words, sir, to tell you how proud I am of my son. He's here, he's 20. Oh, God, yes. It, it, it's like I said. Are your other kids, are your other kids all outstanding? Or do you have some yes. some not quite as good? We got some soccer players, right? So, you know, they're always a couple in the, in, in the group here. And I have, um, I, we have soccer players, cheerleaders, sir, singers. It's, it's a roundabout of talent. And they all have their special ways in their own ways. You know, they're all truly amazing kids. So, yeah, um, we are truly blessed. Yes, we are. Well, you just take care of yourself. Yes, sir. Come around and see me when you're in Washington. And say hello to your children and tell them their father was a great hero that I respected. And, and just, I learned a lot. Before I made the call, I like to learn. And, and it's amazing what kind of a guy he was. So just tell him I said your father was a great hero. And take care of yourself, Natasha. You know that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, and to you the same. Okay, I really appreciate it, sir, and thank you. Thank you very much for myself and family. Thank you. Thank you very much, darling. You take care. You too, sir. Bye. So, are you starting to get the impression that maybe Donald Trump is not as bad as he has been portrayed to be, after all? Well, that gets us to uh, the final big question. Is Donald Trump a Christian? I know he claims to be. He uh, is claimed to be Presbyterian. Uh, and, but just recently, in the last couple of weeks, he's come out and said that he's no longer Presbyterian. He's non-denominational or something like that. And uh, I, I do not believe that Donald Trump is a regenerate Christian. And uh, I, I say that for a number of reasons, but to kind of bring some focus to this and and mr trump if by some chance you are watching this video uh please do please do know that i i'm very supportive of the things that you have done in the white house and your policies and and uh i, I think obviously i've spent uh, the this the entirety of our video here pushing back against the really nasty claims that so many have made against you but uh, i want to get down to what is most important the most important question and that is this are you a believer are you truly regenerate are you in a saving relationship with jesus christ and uh, show a couple of clips here and we'll talk about this and why i'm so very concerned uh, by your answers concern for you and concern of course for the uh, broader testimony of the gospel so if mr president if by some chance you're watching this please uh please bear with me here and um let's talk about these clips just got one more because you used the word christian have you ever asked god for forgiveness that's a tough question i i don't think in terms of i have i'm, I'm a religious person shockingly because people are so shocked when they find this out uh, i'm protestant i'm presbyterian and I go to church and I love God and I love my church. And Norman Vincent Peale, the great Norman Vincent Peale was my pastor. The power of positive thinking. Everybody's heard of Norman and I love my church. And Norman Vincent Peale, the great Norman Vincent Peale was my pastor. The power of positive thinking. So Norman Vincent Peale was a preacher in the Dutch Reformed Church, just as was Robert Schuller. And they were both known for their emphasis on positive thinking and positive confession. Norman Vincent Peale is known for his book, The Power of Positive Thinking, and uh, it is just absolutely laden with New Age philosophy, uh, New Thought, 
uh, Gnosticism, uh, and much like Word of Faith today, it, it had an emphasis on positive confession, saying the right things, getting the right mental attitude, and then your mental attitude and positive confessions will change the physical reality in which you live. And of course, that's the doctrine of positive confession of the Word of Faith movement, right? Uh, it is, uh, just a, you know, packaged a little bit differently uh, for different groups. But uh, Norman Vincent Peale was a theological heretic. Uh, he was he was criticized even by some Episcopalians back in the day, back in the 1950s and 60s. And uh, if if you're if you're being criticized by Episcopalians for being too liberal, you are way out there. Uh, so this is um, this is not a good thing that our that Donald Trump was being taught by Norman Vincent Peale. Not a good thing at all. It, Norman Vincent Peale's theology was literally 180 degrees antithetical to biblical theology. Everybody's heard of Norman Vincent Peale. He was so great. He would give a sermon you never wanted to leave. Sometimes we have sermons and every once in a while we think about leaving a little early, right? Even though we're Christian. <laughs> Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, Frank, would give a survey would give a sermon i'm telling you i still remember his sermons it was unbelievable and what he would do is he'd bring real life situations modern day situations into the sermon and you could listen to him all day long when you left the church you were disappointed that it was over he was the greatest guy and then you know he passed away but he was a great the, the he wrote the power of positive thinking which is but, a great book but have you ever asked god for forgiveness <laughs> I'm not sure I have. I just go and try and do a better job from there. I don't think so. I think I, if, I, if I do something wrong, I think I just try and make it right. I don't bring God into that picture. I don't. Now, when I take, you know, when we go in church and, and when I drink my little wine, which is about the only wine I drink, and have my little cracker, I guess that's a form of asking for forgiveness. And I do that as often as possible because I feel cleansed, okay? But, uh, you know, to me, that's important. I do that. So that is a fairly well-known clip, an interview that Trump did back in 2015. And he says very clearly that he has not asked God for forgiveness. He doesn't bring God into the picture. He just tries to, you know, do the right thing. And he says he takes his little cracker and little wine and it makes him feel cleansed. And uh, so, you know, dear ones, when someone says that uh, they have not asked God for forgiveness, that is that is clearly a mark of someone who is not a Christian, who does not understand biblical theology. And, and Mr. Trump, if you are watching this by some chance, uh, I say that not to disparage you at all. Uh, I, I say that um, because that is the truth of what Scripture teaches. And uh, Mr. Trump, you have been very poorly served by your spiritual advisors. Most, not all, but most of your spiritual advisors are wolves, false teachers, and charlatans. And I hope that you will please continue to watch this um, because I'm going to, in just a moment, I'm going to, to tell you what the true gospel is and how you can truly be a new creature in Christ. That is available to you. So uh, that's coming here in just a couple of minutes. But uh, real briefly, one other clip from Mr. Trump. Uh, he was asked basically the same question, and this was one year later. This is from 2016. Well, let me ask you, because one of the potential attack lines has to do with an answer you gave to Frank Luntz uh, months ago when you said that you've never asked God for forgiveness. Do you, do you regret making that remark? No, I have great relationship with God. I have great relationship with uh, the evangelicals. In fact, nationwide, I'm, I'm up by a lot. I'm leading everybody. But I like to be good. I don't like to have to ask for forgiveness, and I am good. I don't do a lot of things that are bad. I try and do nothing that's bad. I live a very different life than probably a lot of people would think. And I have a very, Always great, or just I have a very great relationship with God, and I have a very great relationship with the evangelicals, and I think that's why I'm doing so well with Iowa. The life you have now, when you say that you try to do good, that sounds very different from decades of tabloid media coverage in New York in which 
some of your wilder escapades were well, about? Well, I'm talking about I'm talking about over the last number of years. Okay. I've been, you know, I mean, I'm leading a very good life. I try to lead a good life, and and I have. And frankly, um, the reason I'm doing so well in Iowa and leading the polls, including the CNN poll, where I'm 33 to 20. So, Mr. President, when you were asked the same question again some months later, I guess almost a year later, you gave the same answer. You said that you don't, you say you, you like to be good and uh, you don't like to ask God for forgiveness, and you said you are good. And, um, Mr. President, I understand that you think that you are a good person. In fact, the vast majority of people think that about themselves. I, I guarantee if you were to go up to a hundred people at random on the street and ask them, are you a good person? Uh, probably 99, if not a hundred of them would say, yes, I'm a good person because what we like to do is we like to compare ourselves to other people. And if I were to compare myself to Hitler or Mussolini or Pol Pot or one of these uh, ISIS terrorists that you have uh, taken out for us here in the last few years, uh, sure, yeah, I guess I could make the case I'm a pretty good guy. I've never done any of those things. But God does not evaluate our goodness by comparing us to other people. He evaluates our goodness by comparing us to himself because he is good and there is only one good and that is God, Mark chapter 10. So God is the definition of goodness. He is our standard of goodness and none of us measure up to his standard. His standard is perfection, absolute 100% moral perfection. And none of us measure up to that, none of us. All of us have broken the 10 commandments, God's laws, God's moral standard. All of us have. Uh, one of the commandments is thou shalt not lie. Uh, Mr. President, have you ever told a lie? Of course you have, and I don't mean that in any kind of political sense, like the fake news kind of stuff, but of course you have told lies, because we have all told lies. I have told lies. In fact, the Bible says, let God be true, and every man a liar. Every single one of us are liars, because we have lied. And it doesn't matter um, that maybe we've told more true things, as opposed to lies. You know, it's, it's just not a, a balancing out kind of a thing. All of us are, are liars. If you tell one lie, you are a liar. Just like if you murder one person, you're a murderer. You only have to want murder one person before you're a murderer. So you only have to tell one lie before you're a liar. So we're all liars. Uh, thou shalt not steal. If you have ever taken anything that does not belong to you and the value of the item that we take is irrelevant, but if you've ever done that, then you are a thief. So we are all liars, we're thieves. Almost all of us, if not all of us, have taken something that does not belong to us. We're liars, we're thieves. We are guilty of what the Bible calls blasphemy. When we take the name of God or Jesus in vain, use his name as a curse word. Uh, that is called blasphemy. So GD, or people uh, using the name of Jesus Christ in an irreverent way, that is blasphemy. In fact, blasphemy is, is more than just profanity. It's more than just taking the name of God in vain. It is also blaspheming God's name by our deeds and by our sinful deeds. So so we are all liars. We're blasphemers. We are thieves. Um, the Bible says, thou shalt not commit adultery. And uh, all of us have committed adultery, even if we have not been physically unfaithful to our spouses. You see, Jesus says, if you look at a woman with lust, you've committed adultery already in your heart. So whether or not we have committed the physical act, just by looking at another person with lust, uh, that's adultery. And so you see, when you start going through God's standard of moral perfection, we realize very quickly that we are uh, woefully inadequate. We have broken God's laws thousands upon thousands upon thousands of times throughout the courses of our lives. And just like when we break laws on earth, there's a penalty to be paid, right? When you break a law on earth, there's a penalty to be paid. How much more so when we break the laws of God? 
But unlike when we break laws on earth, the punishment of that law breaking is temporal. When we break the laws of God, you see, we have sinned against God who is eternal. And because he is eternal, the punishment of that sin is also eternal. And a lot of people say, oh, well, okay, yeah, I've done some bad things. I'm sure I've committed some sins, but you know, my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds. And because God is good, um, he grades on a curve, you know, and he'll understand. I've maybe messed up a few times, but but he understands most of the time I, I, I do good. And so, so he'll let me into heaven. But you see, that doesn't work. In fact, it doesn't work with God. It doesn't even work here on earth. So if I were to go and rob a liquor store or a 7-Eleven, uh, armed robbery, and uh, let's say I in the in the armed robbery I shoot the clerk, and uh, so I've, I'm guilty of armed robbery and murder, and I flee the scene, and the law catches up with me. The security cameras were rolling, so they caught me on tape, and so the police catch me, they arrest me, and I'm put into jail. But I have my day in court, and so I go to court, and they play the videotape. And all the evidence is there. I'm clearly guilty, and I'm found guilty by a jury of my peers. And the judge says this, Well, Justin, you've been found guilty by a jury of your peers. I'm about to pass sentence on you. Do you have anything to say for yourself in your defense before I do so? What if I were to say this? Well, Judge, um, I think you're a good judge. And because you're a good judge, I think you should let me go. You see, judge, I've only killed one person in my whole life on one day. I have lived tens of thousands of days in my life, whatever the math is on that, but multiple, multiple, multiple thousands of days. Uh, and I've only killed one person, judge, on one day. None of the other days of my life have I ever killed anybody. So... I think that more than balances out, and so I, th I think you should let me go. Now, what if the judge said this? Wow, Justin, I've, I've never really thought of it that way. I guess you're right. Uh, you've only killed one person on one day, and, and I am a good judge. So, yeah, I think I'll let you go. You're free to go. We'll see you later. Have a nice day, and I walk out the door. Would that be a good judge? No, of course not. That would be a terrible judge, right? Because a good judge must punish crime. If he was not, if, if a judge does not punish crime, then by definition, he's not a good judge. God is the ultimate good judge. And because he is good, he must punish sin. If he does not punish sin, then he is not, by definition, good. And yet, the Bible says that God is good. And so a lot of people are really counting on God being a good judge and a good God, and that will that will let them off the hook. But it is actually the goodness of God that will seal their fate. And because we have sinned against God, who is eternal, the punishment of that sin is also eternal. And if we die in our sins, we will very rightly and very justly go to a very real place that the Bible calls hell, where the worm will not die, the fire will not be quenched, there will be wailing, weeping, gnashing of teeth forever and ever and ever. The fury of God's wrath. You see, God has wrath. He's, he's good and he's loving and he's merciful, yes. But you see, the mercy of God doesn't make any sense until we first understand the wrath of God. It is only when we understand the wrath of God that the mercy of God becomes precious to us. So... Uh, Mr. Trump, Mr. President, if I were to say to you, uh, Mr. President, I've got great news for you. Uh, I'm going to show you mercy. You would be wondering, what's this guy talking about? Show me mercy. I I've never even met Justin. What does he mean, show me mercy? It doesn't make any sense, right? Because you've not done anything against me personally. And so it would be nonsensical for me to say, hey, Mr. Trump, I've got great news for you. I'm going to give you mercy because you haven't done anything personally against me. So you see, it is only when we understand that we have sinned against God, that we have broken his laws and his wrath abides on us. And that is what the Bible teaches. The, the wrath of God burns against the wicked. Uh, it is only then that the mercy of God becomes precious. It is only when we first understand that we deserve his wrath. And that is what 
our sin has earned us. In fact, Paul, the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 3, he says uh, that the wages of sin is death. The wages, what our sin has earned is death, eternal death. And so if we die without our sins being forgiven, then we die eternally in the lake of fire and the wrath of God will be poured out day and night forever and ever and it will never end. That's what we deserve. That's what you deserve, Mr. President. That's what I deserve. That's what all of us deserve. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 And no amount of good works can make up for the debt of sin, uh, the, the debt that our sin has incurred. No amount of good works. You see, we can't help enough little old ladies across the street to make up for our sin debt to God. We can't do that. Uh, just like I could not tell the judge in our example a moment ago, I could not say, well, I tell you what, judge, yeah, yeah, I, I'm guilty of murder, but I tell you what, I'm, I'll go wor work in the soup kitchen and uh, I'll do some community service and put in some hours working at the soup kitchen or I'll go work for Habitat for Humanity. I'll help build some homes for some um, um, you know, poor folks. Uh, that'll let me off the hook, right? It, it wouldn't work. It, of course it wouldn't work. It's not going to work with God either. In fact, it is an insult to God to suggest to him that we can somehow work our way out of the debt, the sin debt that, that we owe him. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 64 that our works are as filthy rags, filthy rags before a thrice holy God. The Bible says that God is holy, holy, holy. And no amount of good works can make up for the debt that we owe God, that our sin has incurred. And so there's a problem. God is good. God is holy. God is just. He must punish sin. We cannot earn our way into his good graces because of the, the unfathomable eternal debt that we owe him, uh, the wrath of God that burns against our sin. We can't save ourselves. And so God must punish sin. And if he does not punish sin, then he is not good. So he must punish sin. We can't earn forgiveness for our sins. So how do we how do we obtain eternal life? Here's what God did. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to this earth. And Jesus lived a perfect life, fully man, fully God, the God-man. Jesus was one person with two distinct natures, human nature, divine nature. He was God from eternity past, but in Bethlehem, Jesus became a man. He took on a human nature added it to his deific nature, one person, two distinct natures, the God-man. And Jesus lived a perfect life on this earth. You see, Jesus never sinned. He never broke any of God's laws. Jesus lived a life of complete moral perfection, complete obedience to God the Father. And then Jesus willingly laid down his life on the cross, his life was not taken. He gave it. Jesus gave his perfect life as a perfect sacrifice to perfectly satisfy the perfect wrath of God. He became our substitute. All of our sin debt that we have incurred was, the Bible uses a term called imputed, was counted to Jesus and Jesus was not a sinner, but God treated him as though he were a sinner. And he took on our sin debt. And then the wrath of God that burns against our sin, God directed towards his son, Jesus Christ. Even though Jesus did not deserve one drop of it. But God poured out his wrath for the sins of his people that they have committed. Poured his wrath out on the son. And Jesus died on the cross. The wages of sin is death. Jesus died on the cross, even though he did not deserve to. And he satisfied the wrath of God. And then three days later, bodily raised from the dead, proving himself to be who he said he was. 
God in human flesh. And Mr. President, the only way to be saved is to repent of sin. The Bible uses this term, repent. It means to turn from sin and place your trust in what Jesus Christ did for you, did for me on the cross. Salvation is not of works. Lay your works down. Uh, and taking communion, taking a little, little wafer, a little cracker, and a little wine, that's not going to cleanse you. Your good works are not going to cleanse you. And though I admire you uh, for you know, paying off that couple's mortgage and, and doing some of these things that we've been talking about in this video, uh, that is commendable, Mr. President, but it is not going to earn you salvation. It does not make you a good person. The Bible is very clear. There is none righteous. No, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. There is no such thing as a good person. You're not a good person. I'm not a good person. You're a bad person. We all are. Mr. Trump, if you are willing to turn from your sin, repent, and place your trust in Jesus Christ, in Him alone, God will save you. Now, let me say something about repentance. Because repentance is not just trying to be good. And uh, uh, you referenced that in the video that we just watched, that you try to be good. That's not what repentance is. You see, genuine repentance, the word repentance in the Greek is the word metanoia, and it means to change your mind. And it, But it, it means a lot more than that because there's a context in which it is used. Genuine repentance is in and of itself granted by God. God grants repentance. And when God grants repentance to us, our minds are changed, but everything about us is changed. Our desires are changed. Our affections are changed. We begin to love what God loves, and we hate what God hates. And the Bible speaks of two different kinds of sorrow over sin. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul says, that there is a worldly sorrow that leads to death, but then there's a godly sorrow that leads to repentance unto salvation. What is a worldly sorrow that leads to death? A worldly sorrow is nothing more than a guilty conscience. A worldly sorrow is the this sentiment. What would happen to me if my sin were exposed? What would be the consequences to me? And so we try to cover up our sin. Not because we grieve over our sin, but because we don't want the consequences of our sin. But if we could get away with it, you see, if nobody would know what we're looking at on the internet, if nobody would know what we're doing here on the side, if nobody would know about our um, you know, shady deals or whatever it is, whatever sin, if nobody would know about it, if we could get away with it, then we would run right back to it. That is a worldly sorrow, and Paul says... The Apostle Paul, that a worldly sorrow leads to death, eternal death. But there's another kind of sorrow over sin, and that is a godly sorrow. Paul says a godly sorrow leads to repentance unto salvation. What's a godly sorrow? A godly sorrow over sin is that sorrow that is vertically oriented. A godly sorrow comes when we grieve over our sin because we understand that our sin grieves God and we do not want to grieve him. We do not want to grieve his person. A godly sorrow is the kind of sorrow that David had in the Old Testament in Psalm chapter 51. You see, Mr. President, David, uh, King David had committed adultery. Uh, he committed adultery with a woman named Bathsheba and who was married, and he tried to cover up his adultery by sending uh, her husband, Uriah, to the front lines and to do battle where he knew he would be killed. And so uh, you, can, you can read about this in the Old Testament. So, but when then God sent a friend to King David to, uh, by the name of Nathan. And Nathan came up to David, and I'm paraphrasing here, but Nathan came up to David and he pointed his finger at him. He confronted David and he said, you are the man, you are the man. And God used that to break David to convict him of his sin. And David cried out, it's recorded in Psalm chapter 51, David cried out against you and you alone, O Lord, have I sinned? David knew that his sin was first and foremost against God, and it grieved him 
That is a godly sorrow. Does your sin grieve you? This is one of the hallmarks of a genuine Christian. It is not that Christians cannot sin. Christians can and do sin. I am a Christian. God has saved me. Does it mean I'm perfect? No. Does it mean that I never sin? No, of course I do. But when I sin as a believer, when I sin as a Christian, it grieves me. It grieves me because I know that my sin grieves God, and I don't want to grieve Him. And a Christian can stumble into sin, but a Christian does not swim in it, does not relish sin, does not enjoy sin, does not look for opportunities to sin. When we as Christians sin, it grieves us. Does your sin grieve you? Do you understand that you have sinned against God? Do you understand that your sin grieves Him? And does that grieve you? Mr. President, if you will come to Jesus Christ, lay your works down, abandon them. If you will recognize that you are a sinner, deserving of the wrath of God, if you will come to Christ and confess your sins before Him, ask Him to forgive you. You do need forgiveness, Mr. President. You do. Your sins have earned the wrath of God. And if you do not have the forgiveness of God for your sins, you will not inherit heaven when you die. You will go to hell. You will spend eternity in the lake of fire. That's what everyone deserves. But if you will come to Christ, confess your sins to Him, ask Him to forgive you, Ask Him to grant you repentance. If you will come to Him in that godly sorrow, Mr. President, He will save you. Jesus says, The one who comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. He will save you. Mr. President, I know that this is not a message that you have been hearing from your spiritual advisors. Um, you've been very poorly served by your spiritual advisors. But what I've just shared with you is the gospel. It is the gospel. That is the truth of what Scripture teaches. There is salvation in no one else but Jesus Christ. Come to Him, Mr. President. Confess your sins before Him. Ask Him to forgive you. If you come in that godly sorrow over your sin, He will. He will save you, and you will pass from death to life. Thank you very much, Mr. President, for watching this. I have been praying for you for a long time, and I will continue to pray for you. In fact, I am recording this on November the 3rd, Election Day, and um, I don't know how it's going to go. Whichever way it goes, I will continue to pray for you. I want to thank you for your service to this country. You have been the most uh, attacked and vilified and, uh, on so many levels. And I, I want to thank you for your service to this country. But I, I especially want to thank you for watching this video. All, the, all these other things, uh, they are just temporal. They're not going to last. Uh, even if you are granted re-election, um, it, none of these things are going to last in the grand scheme of things. The United States of America is not going to last. The only thing that truly matters is where we are in relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So thank you for watching. And for all of the rest of you who are watching who are not the President of the United States, I want to thank you as well. And I pray that you, if, uh, if this has convicted your hearts of, of your sin, that you will come to Christ, trust Him to save you. And if you come in that godly sorrow, in repentance, trust Him and Him alone. He will. You'll pass from death to life. That is is the good news of the gospel and that while we were yet sinners christ died for us all right dear ones until our next time together may the grace of our lord jesus christ the love of god and the fellowship of his holy spirit be with you all